Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Excellent, excellent. We're going, thank you, brother. We're going to jump right into the Word of God. As we do, let me just say a very special thank you to our media team, our audio team, our video team, those that are working the wall. Thank God for them. You know, whenever I get the chance, I like to just give them some acknowledgement because they're one of the ones that are behind the scenes, but none of this works without their diligence. So thank you guys so much. Let's get into the word. I need you guys to do me a favor. Actually, it's more of a favor for you. I need you guys to pray for me, and I need you guys to pray for you. I need you to pray for me that this word would come out the way that God wants it to come out, that doesn't get messed up by me and my issues. So I need you to pray for me for that. I need you to pray for you that you would receive it purely the way that God wants you to receive it and walk out of here with the word he wants you to have. So let's go before the Lord. Let's pray. I need God. You need God. We need the spirit of God's help. Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us, Lord. And God, today we're asking in Jesus' name that you by your spirit would touch us, God. We're asking that you, by your spirit, would empower us, that you, by your spirit, will cause us to receive your word. Holy Spirit of God, we're putting everything else aside. Whatever issues that we walked into here with, Lord, whatever happened to us this week, Lord, good or bad, whatever we got on our minds, Lord, whatever struggles we're dealing with, whatever burdens, all of that, God, we're putting all of that on hold right now so that we can focus on you and your word. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, would you speak to us, God? And would you give us an encounter with you that changes us forever so that none of us walk out of here without having received a touch from you? Father, we're asking for this type of encounter where you cleanse us. This type of encounter where you make us whole and pure. This type of encounter, not just for those of us here at 730 service here in Fontana at Loveland. God, we ask that you do that down the street at Calvary Chapel, across town at Crossroads, over at Abundant Living, Lord. That you do it, Lord, at St. John Missionary Baptist Church, Rubido Missionary Baptist Church, at The Rock, at Sandals, Lord, World Changers, all of these wonderful churches, Lord, the way we thank you, God, that we're not in competition with any of them, but we are co-laborers with them, Lord, building up one name and one kingdom, and that is yours. So, Spirit of God, help us and touch us today as you touch them. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. So, some of you guys remember that a couple weeks ago, uh, we started a little mini-series we put it on hold, but we started a little middle series, mini series called The New Season. And it's because a lot of times we find that God brings us to new seasons, new phases in life. Sometimes God brings us to new career opportunities. He brings us to new relationships. Sometimes he literally moves you from one location to another. But we know that in times God brings us to new seasons. And a lot of times when God brings us to new seasons in life, Sometimes we get a little afraid. Sometimes we get a little bit uncertain. Doubt might try to creep in. And we might get to worrying a little bit. Because we're used to the old season. We're used to the way God used to do things. And when he changes things up, we got a little bit of anxiety. We got a little bit of uncertainty. But as we saw in the first two parts of this series, and as we'll see today, when God brings us to a new season and when God changes up how he does things, he gives us instructions on how we can navigate that new season successfully. He gives us instructions on how we can step into the new things that he brings to us and not only maintain what we had before, but excel and elevate into something greater. Right. And we see those instructions in Joshua chapter 1. If you go there with me, Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 1. In this chapter, in this verse, in this passage, we had the children of Israel, and they had stepped into a new season. They started out, as we saw, that 
They were in captivity in Egypt to the Egyptians. They cried out to God. God brought them out of that season into a new season where they were wandering in the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God said, okay, now it's time for you to step into the promise that I have to you. God said, now it's time for you to step out of the old and step into the new. And the new might be different from what you're used to. The new might be uncertain. You might not know what lies ahead in the new, just like that song the praise team just led us in. But he says, and I'm paraphrasing this part, I will sustain you. Just like we sang a second ago, I will sustain you in the new season. If you do the things that I tell you to do, I'll give you victory in the new seasons if you do the things that I'll tell you to do. And what did he tell them to do? Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river in the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Watch verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful. Wherever you go, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You can be seated. Now, in the first two parts of this series, specifically after part two, we realize that God repeated a statement three times. Three times. And for God to say something once is enough to catch our attention. It should be. If God tells us one thing, one time, that enough should tell us we need to pay attention and understand what he's saying. If God tells us something twice... We need to understand he's repeating it because he knows there's something wrong with us where we didn't get it the first time, so we need to lock in and make sure we get it the second time. But if he says it three times, that means you and I need to do everything in our power to put everything else aside and get a firm and strong understanding of what it is that he keeps repeating. Now, last time, we paid attention to the fact that he said, be strong. And we saw that we need to understand what true strength is. Last time we understood that true strength is our ability to keep moving when we run into resistance. And if the Lord tells us to be strong, it's because he knows in the new season we will fight resistance. We will face resistance. Things won't always be easy. It won't always be a bed of roses. There will be times when we have to face enemies. But when we come up against resistance... He's saying, be strong. In other words, when you come up against resistance, keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't think I'm not with you. Keep going when you come up against resistance. We learned in part two that true strength comes from three things. My trust in him makes me strong. When I learn how to trust in the Lord, that will be a source of my strength. That will give me the ability to go beyond my natural capabilities. We also learn that his word makes me strong. The more I obey his word, the more I understand his word, his word will be a strong foundation up under me. So that when things come up against me, the power of God's word will, watch this, reinforce me. The power of God's word will reinforce me. The power of God's word will reinforce me. 
to give me the strength and power to do what I need to do. But then the third thing we understood about strength was that his presence will make me strong. As long as God is with me, his very presence, not me or my own strength, but his very presence will make me strong enough to overcome the resistance that I felt. That's what we learned about strength in part two. But today we've got to understand what it means to be courageous. Because he didn't just say be strong, he said be courageous. Now strength, when we talk about strength, we're talking about my ability, what I do. We're talking about my motions. We're talking about the fact that God says to go in this direction and I'm going to move in this direction even when I face resistance. It's talking about my ability and what I do when we talk about strength. But when we talk about courage, it's a little different, but it's a little bit the same. When we talk about courage, we're not just talking about my ability. Courage is talking about, watch this, the state of my heart. Courage is talking about what's going on on the inside of me. And that's why courage and strength are married to each other. Because if I don't really have courage on the inside, if I don't really have my heart in the right state on the inside, I'm going to find that I'll have trouble doing the things that the Lord has called me to do. So before I can really lock in and do the things that God has told me to do, I first got to, on the inside, make sure that my heart is in the state that the Lord wants it to be in. You know, that's why the Word of God in Proverbs chapter 4 tells us this. Guard your heart, in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart, for from it flow the issues of life. What is it saying? It's saying I've got to watch the state of my heart. I've got to watch what I allow in my heart. Got to watch what I allow out of my heart because what goes on in my heart will determine the things that are going on in my life. That's why I got to watch the things that I listen to. That's why I got to watch the things that I watch. So I got to be careful the people who I talk to and the words that I allow into my heart because my heart is soil and the state of my heart is going to determine my strength. The state of my heart is going to determine my ability to keep going and doing the things that God has told me to do. Courage is about my heart. And by the Lord saying here in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and be courageous, Here's what we got to get a hold of when he says, be courageous. We are going to face enemies that are bigger than you and I. See, if God is telling us to be courageous, you don't need courage to swat a fly. You're bigger than the fly. You're stronger than the fly. And most of us, when we swat a fly, we swat it without even thinking about it. You don't need courage to swat a fly. That's no challenge. You need courage when you're facing a lion. You need courage when you're facing a bear. You need courage when you're facing a giant. You need courage when you're facing something that's bigger and stronger than you. So here in Joshua chapter 1, when the Lord is saying, be courageous, he's telling you and I beforehand, you are going to face enemies in life that are bigger than you. You are going to face enemies in life that are stronger than you. But when you face these enemies, watch this, don't lose heart. When you face these enemies, when you face these challenges, don't give up. When you face these enemies, when you face these challenges, do not Allow fear to take over your heart. Guard your heart. Because from it flow the issues of life. So he's telling you and I, when you see that enemy coming, that enemy that's bigger than you, be courageous, be brave, and be strong. And here's why. Because I'm still with you. I still got you. And I knew, watch this, when you stepped into the new season, I knew, even though you didn't know, I knew, I knew, I knew that that giant was coming your way when I brought you here. 
so you can be courageous. But, but what does courageous mean? What does courage mean? Because look, we got to make sure that we're not going off the world's definition of courage. The world's definition of courage is not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get me anywhere. If we want to do what God told us to do, we need to understand what does God mean when he says, be courageous. So today we're going to get a biblical definition of courage. Because based on God's own promise in Joshua chapter 1, if we are strong, which we already understood, and if we are courageous... We'll have success, we'll have God's definition of prosperity, and we will overcome. What does it mean to be courageous? Here's a biblical definition. Let me give you the definition, and then I'll show you scripturally where it comes from. Courage, write this down if you have a pen. Courage is your confidence that you can win as long as the Lord is with you. Courage is your confidence that you can win as long as the Lord is with you. Courage is not based on your confidence in you. Courage is not based on your confidence in your own strength. Courage is based on your confidence that you can win as long as the Lord is with you. Now, let me tell you where we get this from so you know it didn't come from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Bible... Arguably, the most famous incident in the Bible, arguably, is the account of David and Goliath. Almost everybody, and I'm not just talking about everybody in the church, I'm talking about in the world. Almost everybody, or at least most people in the world, know the story of David and Goliath. Even if they've never been at church, even if they've never picked up a Bible, most people know the story of David and Goliath. You have this big giant by the name of Goliath. You have this little boy, I mean, probably teenager, young man, but this young boy by the name of David. We have big, strong Goliath, little David, and somehow little David beat Goliath. Classic underdog story. And... Most people that know the story think that the meaning of the story is this. When you face an enemy that's bigger than you and stronger than you, as long as you believe in yourself, as long as you have confidence, as long as you're brave, if you face something that's bigger than you, you can overcome it. That's what most people think. And Hollywood has made billions of dollars making films and TV shows off of that theme. Just believe in yourself. You can overcome any obstacle. Just believe in yourself. You can do anything. Let me give you a hard dose of reality. That's not true. That's not true. You cannot overcome, and especially hear me, those of you that are watching online, you cannot beat any enemy just because you believe in yourself and just because you're confident. I'm sorry to tell you that. Listen, there have been probably millions of tragedies, millions of tragedies and heartbreaking incidents of people that came up against an enemy that were bigger than them, and they thought to themselves, well, as long as I believe in myself, I can beat them, and they got knocked down. If your enemy is bigger and stronger than you, you're not going to beat him on your own. That's just math. That is just math. If your enemy has this much and you got this much, your confidence, your confidence, your confidence is not going to make up the difference. I'm sorry. I don't care how many Hollywood movies out there tell you differently. It's not going to work. And that was not, that was not, that was not the message of David and Goliath's encounter. But when you look in 1 Samuel 17, you had this young man by the name of David and when he went up against Goliath, he showed us what true courage looks like. He showed us what true confidence looks like. He showed us what true bravery looks like. And the meaning and the source of that courage is in that passage. It's just most people skip over it. Today, we're going to delve into it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, look at what happened. You have the Philistines. And they were challenging the Israelites. 
You have Jesse, David's dad, who knew that his other sons had gone to the battlefield to fight the Philistines. And so he says to David, David, take these cheeses and breads, take them to your brothers on the battlefield. David's just a shepherd. He's not a fighter. He's not a warrior per se. He's not a soldier. Let me put it like that. And his mission wasn't to go out there and fight according to his father. His mission was to take this food to those that are supposed to be the soldiers, his brothers. So Jesse gives him the food and David takes the food. He takes it to his brothers and when he gets out in the battlefield, what does he see? He sees all of, not just his brothers, but the armies of Israel. And he sees the armies of the Philistines. And as he looks at the armies of the Philistines, he sees one particular Philistine, this big guy that's somewhere around nine feet tall by the name of Goliath. Number one, he's big. Number two, he's strong. Number two, he's got all kind of armor. He's got swords. He's got spears, breastplates, shields. He's got all of it. He was armed to the teeth. And on top of all that, Goliath was a trained fighter. This man was an assassin. This man was a warrior. This man knew, you know, we might never know how many people he killed before this, but this man knew how to take somebody down. On top of, I mean, it was enough that he was just physically big and strong, but on top of that, he was skilled. He's strong, and he's skilled. He's strong, and he's skilled. He's strong, and he's skilled. And because of that strength, because of that skill, you have all of these other soldiers in Israel that are afraid to fight him. He's sitting here. He's daring one of them, just one of them, come and fight me. Just one of you, come, and let's, 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 let's go toe-to-toe. Nobody wants to step up. None of these trained soldiers in the children of Israel want to step up and fight Goliath until David shows up. And David starts asking questions. David starts getting offended. Whereas everybody else was afraid, David was offended. And look at why David was offended. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 Uh, Look at verse 26. Actually, let's go to verse uh, 23. We're going to start in verse 23. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. That's a sweet pot right there. I mean, (laughs) that's... Can you imagine that? It's like all I need is somebody to just step up, and you're going to get all this. You're going to get money. You're going to get a wife. You ain't going to have to pay taxes. And yet still, the taxes by itself should have been enough. <laughs> but, and yet still, especially in tax season right now, tomorrow, I think we can all feel that. And yet still, nobody wanted to step up. Nobody wanted to step up. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Okay, now watch this. Watch this. The next part of this verse. This is the hidden meaning behind this whole encounter. This is the part that 90% of people miss about why David was able to to overcome Goliath. This is the part right here that tells you and I this was not about an underdog. This was not about somebody that just stepped up and believed in himself and was able to overcome a giant. This, watch this, was David's secret weapon on how to beat this giant. And this, watch this, is you and I's secret weapon on how to beat any enemy. Watch what he says. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
two powerful things right there that we got to wrap our hearts around. Number one, he said, who is this uncircumcised? What did circumcision represent back then? Circumcision back then represented the covenant and the connection between God and his people. Circumcision represented the fact that God says, when you're in covenant with me, any battle you go in, I go in with you. Circumcision represented the fact that God said, you are my people and I am your God and we are connected. So any situation you step into, I step into it with you. Circumcision, watch this, represented an exchange. I'm exchanging, God says, I'm exchanging my stuff for your stuff. I'm exchanging my power for your power. I'm giving you everything I've got, and you're going to give me everything you've got. And watch this. Your enemies then become my enemies. Circumcision represented that connection between God and his people. So when David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, here's what he's saying. Guys, brothers, Israelites, we have a God. We have a connection to the Most High. We never step into anything without him having our back. We never step into any battle without him going with us. We got covenant with God. This guy over here, he's going in by himself. This guy over here has no connection with God. We do. He's uncircumcised. We are connected. So our enemy is his enemy. And you're afraid of this flesh and blood giant? You're afraid of this spear? We have the God that spoke and created the universe. And you're afraid of a shield, a sword, a helmet, and nine feet of meat? Are you kidding me? Who is this uncircumcised? ungodless, un, watch this, uncovered Philistine that he should, what's the next part? Defy the armies of the living God. See, that's why it's important that we wrap our hearts around that because he took it further. Yeah, we have a connection with God. But the Philistines and others, they had some gods too. They had some idols. They had some pagans that they worshipped. But here's the part. David distinguished his God from their gods. Because their gods were just idols made out of wood and stone. Their gods were dead. And when they called on their gods, talking about the Philistines, nothing happened. But David said, look, guys, we are the armies of the living God. When we call on our God, something happens. When we call on his name, there is a response. We're not going to walk up to some idol and cry out to him and see nothing but dead wood and stone. When we call on the living God, life will come to our rescue. When we call on the living God, the armies of heaven have our back. See, you know, you know why David was able to overcome this giant? And even more than that, you know what David shows us here about true courage? True courage comes from the confidence that we can win as long as the Lord was with us. And David had true courage. David said, look, I know I'm just a little boy. And that's why you guys are getting mad at me, brothers, because you're looking at me. That chapter tells us that his brothers and others looked at him like, who is he? He's over here, you know, trying to call out Goliath. And what are you doing? How come you're not uh, watching the sheep? How come you're not doing what dad said to do? You're getting mad at me, my brothers, because you're looking at me and thinking I'm stepping up because I think I'm all this. I don't think I'm all that, guys. My confidence and my courage is not in me because I didn't say, who is this Philistine that he should defy me? I said, who is this Philistine, this uncircumcised, godless Philistine 
that he should defy not even the armies of Israel, but defy the armies of the living God. It's not about me, brothers. I'm not bold because of me, brothers. I'm not courageous because of me, brothers. I'm courageous because I know that the living God is with me. And I know as long as the living God is with me, I can win. And you can win. That's what courage is all about. That's what courage is all about. Listen, today, a little bit over time, let's just go over three things that you and I can do to help ourselves to really be courageous. Because we want to walk in that same type of courage that David walked in, right? When we face a giant, when we face an enemy, when we step into a new season, we want to walk in that same type of confidence and that same type of courage. We don't want to be afraid. But Joshua chapter 1 and as we're about to see in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus himself gave us a recipe for how to be courageous. Here's the first thing you and I need to do if we want to be courageous. Learn to cry out to him. Learn to cry out to him. Listen, there are times that even though we are believers, even though we are saved, there are times where we fight fear. There are times where you're going to face situations where fear is going to come up against you. And you might face a little bit of doubt. You might face a little bit of, God, I don't know. God, I'm feeling a little bit afraid. That's okay because when you feel that fear, when you fear that doubt, when you feel that worry, that stress, that anxiety, here's what you and I know, need to know how to do. We need to learn how to cry out to the Lord. Talk to him. He understands that in this world, there are times we face anxiety. He understands that. And that's not wrong as long as we process it the right way. And the way that we process it is to go to him and say, God, I need help. This thing is bigger than me. This thing is stronger than me. I can't win. But as big as this thing is, God, I know you're bigger, and if you help me, I can win. See, when you learn to cry out to the Lord, here's what it does. When you learn to cry out to the Lord, it reminds you that God is bigger than your enemy. When you learn to cry out to the Lord, it helps you to recognize how much bigger your God is than your problems. Yeah, your problem might be bigger than you. Your problem might be stronger than you. Your problem might be older than you. But God is stronger, bigger, and older than your problems. And as long as you and I recognize that, as long as you and I acknowledge that, it will bring courage. It will build up confidence in our hearts. God, I know this Goliath is too big for me, but you're bigger than it. And so I'm crying out to you. Because when I cry out to you, Lord, it reminds me, it reminds me, it reminds me that you're bigger than my problem. Listen, guys, that is why, hear me on this, that is why praise and worship is so important. Do you hear me? That is why praise and worship is so important. That is why we start out our services with praise and worship. And that is why it is important for you not to just sit back and watch the praise team, but get up and engage in worship. Somebody said, well, I can't sing like them. God doesn't care about that. He's not concerned about the melody that's coming out of your mouth. He's concerned about the melody that comes out of your heart. That's why praise and worship is so important because watch this, watch this. When you learn to praise and worship the Lord it takes your mind off of your problems and it puts your mind on him. It takes your eyes off of your storm. It puts your eyes on Jesus. And the more that your eye, the more that your eye, the more that your eye is on Jesus, the more your courage and your faith will be built up. Next thing you know, you're going to stand up and say, I can face any Goliath. I can face any giant because I see how big my God is. Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1. Let's go back there and look again what he said. Joshua chapter 1, 
verse 4. No, verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then watch right behind that in verse 6, he says, be strong and courageous. In other words, me, me, God is saying, I am the foundation for your strength, but I am also the foundation for your courage. When you remind yourself, when you remind yourself, that I am bigger than your issue. Go with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Look at what happened here. Because we're talking about a New Testament example of what courage looks like. We had this account in Matthew chapter 14 where the disciples, Jesus had ministered to a crowd, and then he went up to the mountain to pray. But before he went up to the mountain to pray, he had sent his disciples across the lake, across the sea on a boat. And Jesus then goes up to the mountain and pray. The disciples are on this boat. They're crossing. They're going over the sea. They're going over the water. And as they're on the water in the boat, a storm comes. And it's a heavy storm. It's a serious storm because it says, it tells us that they were kind of freaking out about it. And in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this storm, shortly before dawn, the Bible says, in other words, the storm had been going through the night. But right before dawn, all of a sudden, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, now remember what we're talking about here, guys about what it means to be courageous. Jesus has given us the recipe right here. We're about to delve into this. Jesus said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. That is a message right there in itself. And look at what, what Peter did in response. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me, Excuse me, tell me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, Jesus said, come, come, come. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but I want you to look first about what Peter did. Peter was afraid, just like everybody else was afraid. Jesus appeared, and Peter did this. He cried out. He spoke to Jesus. Jesus, if this is really you, if this is really about you, tell me to come out to you. Yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I'm facing uncertainty. But I'm speaking to you, Lord, because watch this. If you tell me to come, I recognize as big as this storm is, you're bigger than the storm. And if you tell me to come, I know you got my back. So even though I'm afraid, I'm calling out to you, Lord. And in me calling out to you, I'm recognizing the fact that you have my back and you are bigger than this storm. And me saying something and talking to you is helping me to realize that. Let me give you one more example of what that looks like. 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. In the Old Testament, we had this prophet by the name of Elisha. Elisha. Elisha was the successor for Elijah. And Elisha just like his predecessor, Elijah, was a man of God. He was a prophet, but he had a habit of causing problems for the government at that time because he did what God told him to do. And in him obeying what God told him to do, he ruffled some feathers. He made some people mad, just like you and I will ruffle people's feathers and make people mad when we do the things that God told us to do. And so as a result of this, an army was sent to capture Elisha and his servant. And it wasn't just a couple men. It wasn't even just a squadron. The word of God, as you read this, says this was enough people to surround the area that these guys, Elisha and his servant, were in. So it's probably a few thousand, probably a few thousand uh, soldiers that were sent. 
and they surrounded the city where Elisha and his servant was. And here's what happened in the midst of this challenge, in the midst of this storm. Elisha's servant kind of freaked out. He got worried. And Elisha, seeing how his servant was freaking out, Elisha was good. He was okay. He showed us what courage looks like. But he called out to God as well because he wanted his servant to have that same type of courage. He cried out to the Lord. And look what happened when he cried out to the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord so that he may see. And then the Lord opened this servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wrap your mind around what that looked like again. Remember, Elisha and the servant were in the city. And the army of assassins, warriors, soldiers, what have you, came and surrounded the city. But there was a mountain range There was a hill, some hills that had surrounded that whole area where those soldiers and where Elisha and the servant were at. So even as the the soldiers and the armies surrounded Elisha, even as they surrounded Elijah, watch this, the horses, the chariots of fire, the heavenly host surrounded their enemies. Listen, guys, there are times where it's going to look like your enemies are surrounding you. There are times where it looks like you turn to the left, you got enemies over here. Turn to the right, enemies over here. Enemies in front of me, enemies in back of me. Everywhere I look, I got enemies. God wants you to know when your enemies surround you, he surrounds your enemies. When your enemies are all over the place, God says, don't worry, I outnumber them. Because in order for the armies of the heaven to surround those armies of assassins, guess what? There had to be more of them than there were of the bad guys. There had to be more of the good guys, more of the angels than there were of the bad guys. And the Lord opened up the eyes of the servant so he can see, look, your God's protection is bigger than your enemy. Your God is bigger than your problem. And when we cry out to the Lord, courage can come when we cry out to the Lord because that's when we begin to see that God is bigger than our problems. There's another thing we got to see. Excuse me. Where does courage come from? True courage comes not just from crying out to the Lord because when we cry out to the Lord, that helps us to see how much bigger God is than our problems. But true courage also comes, true courage also comes when we obey him. True courage also comes when we obey him. Go with me real quick back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 in verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. And right behind saying be strong and very courageous, he says this, be careful to obey, to obey, to obey all the law. My servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you might be successful wherever you go. The foundation for courage for you and I is when we learn how to obey the Lord. When we obey his word, when we step out when he tells us to step out, when we move forward when when he tells us to move forward, courage will be built up inside of us. But the recipe for that courage is when we have enough confidence and enough trust to do what God says. Because here's what it means, guys. When I trust God enough to do what he says, that shows my faith in him. When I trust God enough to obey him, that's me telling God, God, I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know what's in store. I don't even know what tomorrow brings. But I have enough trust in you. I have enough faith in you, Lord. That even though I don't know, I recognize you know, so I'm going to obey you. And even that much faith to obey him will build up courage on the inside of us. Back to Matthew chapter 14, because we just saw this. We just saw this, an example with Peter. Back in verse 27, Jesus says, what? Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water Verse 29, come, Jesus said. And then verse 29, right after that, 
Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Even though the storm was still raging, even though the lightning was still striking, the winds were still blowing, Peter was probably wet, Peter was probably cold, he still felt the effects of the storm, but when Jesus said, come, Peter got out of the boat. And what does the boat represent for you and I? The boat represents our comfort zone because sometimes Jesus tells us to step into an area that we're not comfortable with. Sometimes Jesus tells us to go somewhere that we don't want to go, somewhere that we don't really like, somewhere that, watch this, stretches us. But Jesus says, step out of your boat and do what I told you to do. Step out of your comfort zone and come and do what I am commanded you to do. Obey me even though it's not easy. Obey me even though it's not comfortable. Obey me even though, watch this, it's going to cost you something. And that obedience shows courage. But here's what that obedience, which leads to courage, and then that courage leads to this. Watch this. Peter, the Bible says, walked on the water to go to Jesus. Are we, are we, are we recognizing that? Yeah. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. He saw Jesus walking on the water, and now because he obeyed him, Peter is walking on the water. He's doing something that is naturally impossible because he had enough courage to obey the Lord. You know, it kind of reminds me about somebody else that we just read about that did something that was naturally impossible because he had enough courage to obey the Lord. This guy by the name of David that we just saw who came up against a giant who had more fighting experience probably than David had years of life. And yet somehow David was able to overcome this giant. Why? He stepped out of his comfort zone and obeyed the Lord. He stepped out of his boat and did what God told him to do. And when he showed courage, when he showed courage, when he showed courage in the word of God, God had his back and gave him the power to overcome. When Peter showed courage, by obeying God's word and stepping out of the comfort zone, God had his back and allowed him to perform a miracle by walking on the water to go to Jesus. When you and I show courage and we obey God's word even when it doesn't make sense, we obey God's word even when the people around us tell us that's crazy, when we obey God's word, even when the news and the media and sometimes even your family members will say, no, that's not the way to go. That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? It's not going to be easy. It's going to cost you too much. It's going to take too much out of you. But when you and I show enough courage to obey God's word, no matter what, God says, I will honor your courage. I will honor your courage by giving you the ability to endure the storm and overcome your giants. I will give you the ability to beat your enemies as long as you show enough courage to obey me. That is why, guys, again, going back to Joshua chapter 1, look at what he said in verse 8. He went back down. Not only did he say, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you, but he doubled down in verse 8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to observe all that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous. Then you will be good. You will have good success. What's the point? The key to courage, the key to miracles, and the key to winning in your new season is when you and I have enough guts, enough courage to obey God's word. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. Not only does courage come when I cry out to him, not only does courage come when I obey him, Courage comes when I remember that he's with me. Amen. Courage comes when I remember that he's with me. Go back to Matthew 14 one more time. Matthew 14, because look at how this whole thing started. Verse 27, even though they were afraid, even though they were freaking out talking about the disciples, Jesus said one statement, which could really be a whole series, one statement Jesus said that is the recipe for you and I to have enough courage to face any enemy. Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. 
don't be afraid. Take courage. In other words, he didn't just say take courage. He didn't just say be, be a, a, a brave. He didn't just say have confidence. He said, here's why you can take courage. Here's why you can have confidence. Courage equals me being here. Courage equals my presence. You can take courage, he's saying to them, and he's saying to you and I, because even though you are in the midst of the storm, and the storm hadn't ended yet, even though the lightning is striking, and the lightning was still striking here, the thunder is bellowing. Ever heard thunder that feels like an earthquake? I'm sure that's what they were experiencing right there. Thunder so hard, it shakes you. But even though you're feeling that thunder, he says, even though you're wet and you're cold, here is the key, here is the recipe for courage. Recognize and remember that I am here. I am here. And here's what that means. Because, you know, some of us, some of us, we need to go a little bit deeper. John 6.33, Jesus said this. He said in John 6.33, I'm telling you these things so that in me you might have peace. This is John 16.23. And watch what he said behind that. In this world, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you might. Not it's a 50% chance. 70, 60% chance. No, he says, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble. But, I love it when Jesus puts a but behind that type of statement. But, take heart. But take heart. Remember what we talked about? We said courage is about the state of your heart. We said courage is about what goes on in the inside of you. But take heart, he said, and here's why. I have overcome the world. So what does it mean when Jesus says, take courage, it is I? What does it mean when Jesus says, I have overcome the world? Yes, you will have problems in this world, he says. Yes, you will have trouble. But every problem that you have, every trouble you have, Jesus is saying, I already overcame it. Every enemy you face, Jesus said, I already beat him. Every Goliath that comes your way, Jesus says, I already beat them down for you. I beat them down before you were even born. Not just before you faced the battle. Jesus says, before you got here, before your parents got here, before your grandparents got here, every problem that you face, I already overcome. I already beat your Goliaths. I already beat your giants. I already beat your enemies. I already conquered your storm before you even got here. So take heart, because I overcame the world. And take courage. Take courage. Take courage. It is I. You don't need to be afraid. Three things we learned today about what it means to be courageous. We learned that courage is my confidence that I can win as long as God is with me. Courage is my confidence that I can win as long as God is with me. I get courage from three things. When I cry out to the Lord, God, I need help. This thing is bigger than me, but I need help. And when I cry out to the Lord, that's going to remind me how much bigger my God is than my problem. I get, I get courage when I obey him because I step out of my boat as I step out of my comfort zone and do what God told me to do, that's going to build courage and confidence on the inside of me. And finally, I get courage when I remember that he is with me because every problem I faced, he already overcame. If God spoke to you, give God a hand clap. Listen, man. Praise God, praise God. As a believer, as a child of God, as a daughter of God, as a son of God, you and I, we never have any reason to truly be afraid. As a matter of fact, not only should we not be afraid, but the Bible puts it like this. The wicked man flees when no one pursues. But the righteous are as bold as as a lion. What does that mean? When I'm wicked, when I'm living life in my own strength, when I'm living life my own way, yeah, I got a reason to be afraid. That's right. That's right. I'm going to be running around afraid of everything. Right. 
But when I'm righteous, when you're righteous, you face any situation with the boldness of a lion. But what does it mean to really be righteous? What does it mean to really be righteous? Righteousness is not, not, not about me doing everything right. Righteousness is not about being a good person. Righteousness is not about people looking up to you. Righteousness is not about dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. Here's what true righteousness is. Righteousness and courage, true courage, comes when I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. See, you don't get righteous and you don't go to heaven just because you come to church or because you watch church online. If that's all you have, church attendance is good, don't get me wrong, but if that's all you have, you're not going to have what you need to overcome the enemies in life. And you're not going to get to heaven just because you come to church. Righteousness, courage, true courage, is not going to come just because people look up to you or just because you've never claimed another religion. And that's not going to get you to heaven either. True courage, as we said, comes from knowing that the Lord is with you. And what brings the Lord with you is when you and I have enough humility and enough sense to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, and this was a man who was a leader in his church, a good guy, a religious paragon. But Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Not enough for you to be a leader in your church. Not enough for you to be a good person. If you're not born again, you're not going to make it into heaven. And Jesus had another message as well in Revelation chapter 3. Here's what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3. He said this to the church, to believers. He said, I'd rather that you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, Jesus said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He didn't say that to the world. He said that to the church. And what does it mean to be lukewarm? Lukewarm means that I'm a part-time Christian. Yeah, maybe on Sundays I act religious and quote Bible verses, come to church, wave my hands, sing a few songs. But then Monday through Saturday, my life is so far away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You'd think I didn't even know how to say the name of Jesus. What does lukewarm mean? I say a token prayer here or there, but I don't have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. What is lukewarm? God is something in my life, but he's not everything in my life. And Jesus said that type of person will be ejected and rejected from the mouth of God. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, I want you to raise your hand. You online as well. And I'm not talking about I go to church and I call myself a Christian. No, we're beyond that. If you have never spoken to Jesus Christ and asked him, to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. Or if you're that lukewarm Christian, the one that the Bible calls backslidden, you had a relationship in the past, but you've fallen away. You don't talk to him anymore. You don't listen to him anymore. You've, you've just come away from him. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Or if you're a third person, you have a relationship with God, but you need to get plugged into a church. Now, that's what the Bible said, because church is God's idea. It's not man's idea. God wants you to be plugged into a church. And if you want to join Loveland, then I want you to raise your hand. And those of you online, we're going to tell you what to do in a second. Here we go on the count of three. Any one of those three people you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time, you want to rededicate, or... You want to join this church. Count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Let me see your hand.
you see your hand. Never given him all of your heart. Never given him all of your life. You want to rededicate. You want to join this church. Slip your hand into the air. Those of you that are online, if that's you, you want to give your life to Christ, you want to rededicate, we're all going to say a prayer in just a minute if you're online, and I'm going to ask that you say, say this prayer with us in just a moment. But right now, I want everybody to stand. I want everybody to stand. And again, if you're one of those three people, you've never given Christ all of your heart and all of your life, you want to rededicate or you want to join this church, if that's you. I want you to come forward right now. Never given them all of your heart. Never given them all of your life. Want to rededicate? Want to join this church? Come forward right now. Come forward right now. Come forward right now. Amen. Amen. Those of you that are online, if that's you, we're going to say a prayer right now. And I'm going to ask that everybody here in this building say this prayer with me to encourage you. So if you're online, you want to rededicate your life or give your life to Jesus Christ, just close your eyes so you don't get distracted. And let's all repeat this prayer right now. Say this, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood. Make me into the person you want me to be. Lord Jesus, I need help living life the way you want me to. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, lead and guide me in all the ways of my life. You can stop repeating now. Father, I thank you for those that are online that might have made this decision, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their lives and what you're going to do. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're online, if you made that prayer, if you said that prayer, at the bottom of your screen, you see there's some instructions. We want you to go to our website, lovelandchurch.org. Go to lovelandchurch.org. Click the button that says respond to God. Respond to God. Answer those three quick questions, and then we've got some gifts we're going to give you, okay? Do that. God bless you. Pastor Chuck, Pastor Char, Pastor Charlene, Pastor Chuck. Amen. Let's just, amen. Thank you, Pastor Chuck. We're going to have our benediction as we stand. Those that are going to Sunday school, you're just a couple minutes behind, but, and some are doing that online. God bless you. This is Discipleship Month. So if you are not in a small group, then uh, get in one. Get in one quick. All right. And ladies, ladies. Because, uh, you, you know, this coming Saturday, not just for the ladies, but the whole family, um, we have the dad and kids, the LM, the, um, the out, outside, uh, the dads and, uh, are working with the young kids to do some, a whole lot of stuff, they're grilling and stuff, and inside here, ladies, we are having hidden treasures. Now, we ask everybody to bring a treasure test, and some of you have not been able to find them. So we ordered a lot of not well. We have a limited number of these. We're going to be doing something with these, and they're just three dollars. Just to, and you can get them out in the hallway, or you can just go find your own. But we kind of did the work for you. Okay. And so we're, registration starts at nine fifteen, and the whole day is ten dollars. And that's not just the continental breakfast they talked about. That's your hot lunch too, macaroni right. and cheese and chicken and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, we need some help, ladies. Yeah, we, we've got a great lunch coming. We need some help putting all the activities together. It's going to be very much like the one we did in, in last year where you have all the stuff that we give you. Wednesday, 2.30 to 5.30, if you can come help put stuff together. Um, Thursday afternoon at about 4 o'clock, we're going to be decorating this whole place. And if you have a gift card that you're not using and you never intend to use, can you bring it so we can use it as some of our gifts? All right. All, right. All right, thank you. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. 
Father, we bless you for the word we've heard, and we will take courage. We will be of good cheer, yes. for it is Jesus who bids us come. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In his great name, yeah. Jesus. Amen.